you guys that pretty much know what I do. Can you turn on the car? I'm you. Yeah, that's a good idea. Okay, is it too loud, too quiet? That's right. All right, good. All right. I'm going to count on you guys to holler if I skipped over something that I should have told them <laughs> or something you know, that, that might get them in trouble because I said it wrong. So if they get hurt, you all are blamed. Okay. First thing we'll talk about is the lathe itself. This has a steel knockout bar. They have recessed the back part of this Morse taper because they weren't smart enough to give you a proper bar with brass tip. So if you have a steel bar, you're going to have mushroom centers. If your center has not been relieved, such as this one, you will mushroom the swallow in your lathe. The one that John C. Campbell will mushroom over in excess of a sixteenth of an inch. Okay? All you have to do is put brass tip on there. Everybody in here turns. Brass turns to a little bit harder than wood. We put our knockout bar in our chuck. We drill the hole. We put the brass in there. When we turn the tendon on it, it's just slightly bigger than the hole. You take a torch to this thing, you heat it, you drive that in, it cools, and that's it. You'll never mushroom one of these again, and you can use it for a long time. This mushrooms, and you have to clean it down once in a while, but you know, that's that's a real minimal sacrifice there. The tool rest gets burned up, and sometimes your tools won't slide on it. Draw a file. Take your file and draw it just like so. Don't do this, and you get chatters in it. But if you'll draw it, and just keep working across the end. Remove the sharp edges you just put on the file here. Then paste wax it. There's cams under here and in here. In this place there should be oil. You don't have to have any specific kind of lubricant, just some greaser oil. The lithiums are real good because the dust does not suck the oils out of them and they don't attract the dust. But it's not necessary. This center has been chipped. If you have sharpened your center, then you need to make a witness mark on here so that you always put it back in the same spot. When you ground this, and this is off of 30 seconds, you turn your stuff over and that's going to be off by 16. So if you always put it in the same spot, and then you always put your wood back on there, on that same spot. Even though it's running on the center like that, it's still going to be true out here. Your dead centers. The dead center versus, you've got a solid one versus a rotating one. This is your rotating dead center. This has to have bearings in it or bushings to work. And I mean, you can't hear it, but this thing actually rattles in here. The bearings are that bad. So if you have a long piece of hard wood, you're going to set up harmonics, and you're going to have those real pretty little spirals going down through there that everybody hates. The first thing you should do is get rid of this one and put a solid center in it. The benefit to this is you don't have to have it greased and you don't have to burn it in. And this is just like, about like the wedge you use for splitting firewood. So you don't want to bear down on this center too hard. They have some other ones out there that have a ring around them and I recommend them. These wax works very well for lubricating. It will soften and melt and go up, but it will completely wick away from the stock. And almost all the old times in Europe, they've got to have a real careful job, a real precise job to get rid of the bearing center because it just rattles too much.
You can only knock out one. Okay. Somebody that knows about a one way tell me something. How do you rate these RPMs? Is it, does it translate directly to your one way users? Yeah. Okay. So the one way users know it translates this directly. This screen represents what pull you Okay. So this is the uh, slower pull. All right. This is the big pull. So that would be 3200? Yeah, on the big ones? On the fastest one. On the little okay. one right now, that's 3200. All right. Yeah. So all we need is 1800. Okay. So no, you no, no, on the middle one. Well, the middle one's 18. Okay, okay. So if you've got this at home, uh, and you, you've got the readout, that's okay. And some of the new ones have a different readout, and that's all right. Does anybody have the old pulley? <coughs> no numbers at all? Okay. For those of you who have it and you want the information on how to figure out the RPMs, I can get it with you. We're going to put it in the newsletter if you want it. Uh, it's real simple though, you multiply your motor RPMs times the pulley size, divided by the headstock pulley. And that gives you what you've got. Okay. 4,000 is a base number that you would use to determine how fast you want to turn this piece of stock. This is about three and a half. You would divide 4,000 by the size of your stock. So let's say it's four inches. So we would turn this at about 1,000 RPMs. This is short enough, it won't flex, so we don't have to consider that. If this were a bed post, there's no way I'd turn a bed post that small at 4,000 RPMs. You have to modify for the different variables. If you're off-center, uh, sometimes we turn the kid real foot that's off-center. I slow it down for that. But that's the optimum cutting time. When you get ready, you set your centers very full in there. And then back at the tailstock just a hair. So that you're not putting excessive pressure on it. If you have a small piece of stock, you can actually cause it to blow just from pushing on it. Then you get that harmonic spiral again. Okay. Good. If you're going to do a lot of spinner work, you don't want to have to mark these little pencil all the time. This block of wood has a screw point right there. You do need to be good enough to at least hold the wood. Okay. You can see how this has dropped way down to the bottom. As I rotate it, it centers everything. So all I have to do now is punch it, and I have a hole right there for my center. When you do a bunch of these, and if you're doing porch ballast, this is about three feet long. This is for your foot. You hold it down, you just punch it, flip it over, and punch it. Terry, what if it's not? Square, perfectly square. If it's not a perfect square, then you go back to working by hand. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and go back and cut it again. Let's say that this is your real perfect square. Let me see how I've got. Let me see which way it shows better. So let's say that that's the stock we have. Just a little way here. Okay. We're good. So we're way off center. So you would just come along and ride your finger down that edge of your stock, down that edge, down that edge, down that edge, and then where all these things intersect, wherever that was, right there would have been your center. That was not the best picture up there. If this arm square, we, we would just we do the same thing. Make sure the pressure on that finger is the same on every edge. When we do that, then we get the same extension over the lip. And then we come out with that mark right there. And it's pretty easy 
to get your center in the middle of that plane. And I almost forgot, for those people that know me, I know I'm using wrong nomenclature, but I'm going to tell you anyway. All right? Level. It's an instrument consisting of two rules or arms joined together and opening to any angle for drawing angles or adjusting surfaces to a given depth. Okay. That, that, folks, is a bevel. This is a bevel. Bezel. The oblique side or face of a gem or a sloping edge or face, especially on a cutting tool. That means this is the bezel. Because there are so many authors out there that don't know what they're talking about, I'm going to not confuse you by calling that by its true name. I will try to call it a bezel every time. If I screw up, somebody holler or throw something, okay? Because I really, I'm not here to try and confuse you tonight. That's next time. Okay, we talked about excess pressure and waxing the end. Our steady. How many people have a one way steady? One, two, three, four. Okay. How many people might be doing spindle work later on? Okay. And unless you're really good or really dedicated and innovative and tight as I am, and I bought one, so that tells me something. Okay. And the guys that know me, I don't buy hardly anything. This is the best one for its price. And once you get it, you have to fix it, though. <laughs> It's not really right when you get it. <laughs> First thing is this piece is not on there. So now you're going along, you're working. You need to move this thing and open it up. Well, the first thing that happens when you open it up and you move it is it falls down and smacks your fingers. So you need to put a support in it for it to stop that. Then, so since you have to put it on there, go ahead and make it with that little flat part right there. <coughs> when you drop that on and you set this square, this stops it square. Your wheels aren't running out of alignment like the front end of your car when it eats up the tires. Now, if you get this crooked, that's what it does. It makes real pretty orange curled <laughs> <laughs> you heard that. He told me that. <laughs> Surface treatment. This thing comes with all of these daggone sharp wing nuts. And if you use this very much, it just eats up your fingers. So get rid of them. It'll cost you about six dollars. You need two quarter twenty bolts. Two quarter twenty threaded rod connectors. Actually, I've only got one. I only need one rod connector. Uh, one washer, and that's about it. You replace the wing nut with a threaded rod connector and your bolt. You take your bolt, you bend it. Since it's a wood terminus, we turn the handle to put on it. And right here we have an extra quarter twenty nut. This nut locks this handle in a user-friendly position. After I've tightened this for a while and it just keeps coming down farther and farther, unlock this, back it up, lock it back again, it's right there. Same way here. This is unlocked and that's locked. It's real quick and easy. You want to modify right here so that it stays open. When you buy it, it'll collapse on you. So put a little nylon washer in here and another lock. Put that nylon washer right here, and that allows it to have friction, but it'll stay wherever you put it. 
And then it's a really useful tool. <laughs> I talk to one way people and also to craft supplies. Got nowhere with one way and craft supplies said, well, I'm going to talk to him all and said, he won't fix it. He, he, he said, just come up and do it. The other thing, if you have a mechanism, if your anchor is such that you have to unscrew this thing to get in your light, make a wood one that will pass through the gap in your bed. This little stop on here, when you turn it, hits on the side of the bed, it stops. You continue screwing it in, it locks it down tight. When you unlock it, it opens it up, you tilt it out, and you're done. Terry, why is that rod so long? You get, you get really deep in I have a pawn over length with a, the bed's about that deep. So. <laughs> I have a good length. <laughs> <laughs> What are you having? Ways made out on that leg? What's that? What are the ways made out on your leg? LBL, the laminated veneer lumber, and angle steel. Uh, I think it's four by four by three eighths angle, and I can go nine feet on the centers, and I don't have to have a middle leg in it, so it's pretty nice. You need a hose clamp for that thing to hold your little block there. That's it. So have you used the same type of gizmo, but the bowl steady from there? You can modify the bowl steady to do some of this. And if you go and you look at some really old wood lathes, yeah. all they had was two wheels back yeah. there. Yeah. They actually had another saddle and a post in here that had two wheels. They just said, oh, that was it. Right. Uh, that was pretty much those for the big heavy timbers and different things, so that it just took the harmonics out of it. Right. Because the two wheels were here, this is turning, it's still allowed to bounce up, so you still didn't hold your hand on it. And if you're going to get into this, I left my leather glove at home. Get a really good heavy duty leather glove, smooth piece of wood, and a fistful of wax. And just hold it on there until you can't hardly hold it anymore. It'll fill that leather with wax, it'll polish it down, and it'll harden it, all the solids will go away. But from then on, you can hold your wood without contaminating it severely. So then, once you hit it with sandpaper, it's clean. And it's really worth doing. Well, I've been experimenting with two full steps on the same bracket. Yeah. So that I can have, in essence, four wheels. Yeah. Totally adjustable height and, of course, width. But I don't know if you had any experience with it. It's going to say the magic word. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 oh, was it was it hay or Alan? <laughs> yeah, turn on first. See? Don't hit the red button. Yeah. Just that red button. I like a good light, I'm telling you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know I said you need to set your center firmly and good? With this spinning center, that's a little hard to do. So I'm locking out the wrench in here, so that's that can be set in there, and that sets it in, and I don't have to worry about it flexing too much now. Yes. The old dead Yeah, just turned it into a dead center. Well, with some bearings that might wiggle. If you are not sharing a lathe, then go ahead and get your center up to about here for you. And then see how it feels. If you notice in some of Richard Graffin's books, you see him turning, you see him going like this, because he's got his leg too high. He intentionally put it too high because he's got a bad back, and every time he does that, it straightens his back out when he stretches it so that it doesn't hurt bad at the end of the day. If you turn it yours and your back is real tight, try adjusting the height on it. This really messes you up though when you go to somebody else's leg. It's just the way you do it. I have marked one pencil line on each 
skin on one face only. You can't see that, but we're going to go and This is red wood. And you can see how quick I'm pushing this skew in here. We should have a little bit of tear out. And we do. See where I've started coming down here? I still have to tear out. When I roughed it, I stayed away from my pencil mark. My finished cuts, I'll come up and sneak up on it. Okay. This should be sharpened, and then maybe we'll get a better finish on it. When you, when you sharpen these this way, you do get a convex bevel. We're going to address that later. I really don't want a convex. When I do it this way, my arm stays in one plane. This doesn't move, and I can look down the belly. And now I can see, and I can hear it change. So I'm pretty much getting a flat bevel on here. I cannot get concave whatsoever like this, but I can at least say it's pretty <coughs> flat. And I've got a heavy burn on here already just from that little bit of turning or the uh, hole. What's the stone? This was uh, a diamond cone. Easy lap, diamond. Uh, the grid on it, I don't know. I bought it in 1985. It's sharpened almost every butcher knife in Dome Tech, Korea. I wanted to put it on mechanics, and before I got back, everything down there was sharp. And I use it a lot. And it's really worn down, but it's quite fine now. And I bought it, you know, the one thought I don't need it. Rough this down, and you can you can see you can see the surface texture is really rough, crude. Right? You can see from the real fine dust, and you can hear we're not making an aggressive cut. And according to the books, I'm going backwards. It's not as nice as that one. You can see a little back, I think. There's some of it in there. Should have thrown the largest few for this, but I didn't, so let's see what happens. That is a 
type of cut you want. And that is the type of cut that you don't want. When this edge builds up, that means that you're forcing the fibers up. And if you force them up enough, they tear out and leave a bad surface. If you turn so that you slice them off as you go, like that, you leave a clean surface. One of the reasons that you want a clean surface here is because this is going to be a major diameter. Some of this should not get cut a second time. So you want to address cleanly beforehand. Okay. Having gotten to that step, we'll look at our story stick. This is, that's the least player right there, right? This is my story stick for a new post. It's a standard to industry. It's a number 3010. This is all that I need to turn my post. Now send me the blanks. I know how far from the top it needs to be and how far from the bottom. So that tells me how much extra distance to put in the middle of here. I would simply mark my poles and then proceed from there. As long as your story stick is shorter than these two points, now with the lathe running, you can slip it in here and mark it. If you have one that's full length, this would have to be about a 60 inch stick. And I can't even use it when the lathe is on. And you see people stop and mark it. It takes too long. So you just mark it while it's running. Then I slide down the other end and mark the left. Obviously, I'd like to head along the piece, but, but you can see I do have movement in the point. So I'm going back to my corners. Unless you're an artist, then you can draw half of this much better than you can draw the full design. If you can draw the left hand side better, whichever side is better for you, draw that one. And only draw half of it. Do not draw a full design and then expect to bring your caliper over here and bounce back and forth and get an exact measurement. It's too difficult. I have numbers on here. My calipers are also numbered. So that if I drop one, or when I hang it up, or when I've got a number two down there and a number two down here, I know which one to grab. Some of these have had 12 or 13 calipers on a, on a new post. So you can really get confused in a hurry that way. That's what these numbers are. Tell me two, three, five. This one here is equal to or smaller than two. You've got the size of bulk of the hair. That's it. So now, I can even do this on television. I can anchor on the bottom side, and I'm solid. Now I can anchor on the bottom and adjust my caliper until it's where it runs up here, which is real easy compared to trying to get and watch both sides at once and make sure you're right on a full-scale line. Mary, don't question. I'm not understanding how you treat the wood that's in the middle after you measure from both ends. That's just the one that's the Full size. Where did I go? That's, that's a low note. Well, why didn't I tell you that? Oh, and, and this is all based on if this is a keeper that you want to do later on. Okay, you make it like this. Um, and you lay out from your pommels, 
and then you have that break in your design someplace that is a simple part such as a long taper or a cylinder so that you can just look at your little picture and tell what you have to put there so you know like this right here you could you could put your break in there you and squash that up longer slope. yeah and, and this this right here i've uh, got a glare in there. okay this right here tells me where my break is so that's where i have to add my wood in here this whole thing right here will come down and it will come down and it'll take all the way down like that into here you're probably limited on how much of that you want yeah I just, whatever, longer than you want another element. whatever design it is, you know, I, I turn what they want, not what looks good. Okay. So, I mean, I have to sell it. So that's a brand, half baker, mark your calibers. And then top coat it. This is spray for lack or lacquer or something, so that my, my markings don't wipe off in the drawer. And I've, no, I've marked this so I know which mill it's for when they call me up. And now we'll do a little bit of turning. I just had one of all my calibers. I have to hang up my caliber, so every time I hang up my caliber, I my second was right there in front of me. If you if you're just going to use one burner and go off of this, then you can put it down here somewhere where you can look at it that way. It, it's not so particular where it is as to whether it's properly visible to you. This I really like to know. I argue with instructors all the time. They say, now keep your tool rest an eighth of an inch when you stop. Right, my guidance is, when you get comfortable with an eighth of an inch, walk a quarter, a half, three quarter, an inch, inch and a half. Because if you can't get rid of these two squares, you can't put it up there. I mean, this is it. This is almost as close as it goes. If you have wood that tears out easily, sometimes you can mosh on your carding tool. Yeah, let's see where the best, right there. Can you see the yeah. that groove in the bottom? You just take a drill and it and round that out. What that does is that puts a spur here and here and shears these two faces before it lifts it. If you have a straight one, it lifts the entire thing and tends to pull out more grain than, than this does. It it out. Only slightly. Uh, this is redwood, and it's real bad, and that's why I brought it, so you can see that uh, some of this stuff is white.
made this cut because I cut to the least side. I want to now make sure I put that part so I know where my tenon is so I don't wind up in pieces an eighth of an inch too long. This right here is going to be our major diameter. Just about the worst of my tools, not because I like them, but because there are too many things to try and get in the world either. This is that real thin tapered mechanism, similar to what Mark Soleil was using when they talked about their convex metal. If you watch, once he sharpened his tool in that little mechanism, he no longer had a contact down in his flat. Okay. This part right here should never touch my stock. So I don't care if it's convex, concave, or triangular. It, it shouldn't be touching it, so it doesn't matter. It's just relieved out of the way. Okay. A very aggressive and somewhat kind of tool, and I forgot I rolled a burr on this, like on a, like on a cabinet scraper, for one of the next steps. So we're going to get rid of that burr. Guys, you never like to wipe down your clothes. It's supposed to be a pocket right here, but I will. I got the pants out that I wanted to wear, she switched them over, and I don't have it. They hate pockets. That, uh, that's only a little pocket, it's really nice. We've cut so that on this red wood, we bumped that once with any grit, that's finished. And this out here would need more, but but you can see that's really not too bad right there. Where we left this rough, when we clean this, now you can see why I wanted this full face dressed. Because this is a major diameter. Now if you quit right there, and you go ahead and you turn your stuff to shape, when you sand, when you get rid of this, now you do not have a very defined piece. You got a flat on there. So if you've forgotten, then just simply come back and cut it down some. Diamond 
Starting to form the knees. Yeah. Cut the top off of it. And we cut that out. I think the new camper sells. They might. They sell two sizes. How much money do I spend on food? Okay. We have a Sears giant party for you. Why are you only going to sale? Maybe go out of business if they had to count all day. It makes you more difficult to cut first. And this camera won't show as well, but I want to keep this part. I'm going to cut away this part. If I have my tool tilted too much that way, it's going to run into what I want to keep. If I tilt it too much this way, it runs into what I'm going to cut away. I'm going to start with a too much row to that side. You can see what I did? Too much row to that side, and then straighten it up. So I can come in there and cut it away. There's my pencil line. In this area, we have torn fiber and also that scar where I slid backwards. This cut is more difficult for me to make than this one is. That extra 64th I took off of there will never be noticed when they're that far apart. So if you've even screwed it up worse, uh, you come back that much extra. Now there's a little difference in the shape of the bead. It shows more because the other one was got a full one quarter and more flat. <laughs> Don't waste that piece of wood and get another one. This will come back. You get them flattened out on the little one. Now it has the same profile. It will never be seen. How many people like a skew? Besides straight and paint and open the can and all that. <laughs> You can, you can make all of that stuff for the skew, but if you didn't grind away that corner, you wound up leaving a scar in your spot. The good part about it, it leaves such a nice surface. Right up here, should be ground away, and down here, if, if you're going to use the concave cuts. This is only just barely ground away. See that? He's been chopping and chopping and chopping. It would have been ground clear back to here if it was proper. And again, it has nothing to do with the functioning of the tool. It's just to keep it from scarring up and stop as you go. And because this was still here, I wind up with a little bit of ridge work in here. See that right there? I had to keep this up and therefore I'm unsteady. No, not at all. <laughs> I've got a lot of homemade tools. This is just a high speed steel. And Alan? Hey Alan? You still selling the pots? Yeah. Okay, so if you don't want to do the machinist work for making the collars, Alan still sells those. And if, if you watch, I want to have a good sale on the six inch high speed steel. And I don't, I've not seen it lately, 
But here's where if you bought the soul money more, you got a better price. So the club, you know, you guys want it, and they get ordered 40 or 50. The nice part about it is with less than five or six dollars in this, you really don't mind grinding and reshaping it. And, and I'm grinding and shaping all the time now. Where do you order that? In the town, let's see. Carter, uh, I think it is. Down in Georgia. I think it's Carter. And a few others. It's a quarter eight. It's a quarter. Quarter, half, three eighths are the three main ones. Uh, mainly because that's the size of comics that the guys are making. Uh, and if you would get a half inch comic, your three eighths square will fit into your half inch comic. So you don't have to have another comic to put the square stop. Right in both ends, just turn the other one over. And then when you put it in there, put the top side you're in use in line with your set screw and now you know where it's at when it's up inside of there or when it's left all over. You look at your set screw, that's where your cutting edge is. Okay. This thing, some people call it a three-point tool, I counted about a thousand times, might only have one. Uh, <laughs> Got three facets, but I don't have one total. This is why this tool was used primarily on hard woods, not soft woods, because they can't stand up to it. But on hard woods, it's fantastic. So, is drill rod the same thing? This is actually this is actually hard. They're hard. This, this is in two sticks. Still, just like the yeah, this is the same piece of Chinese steel that you got in the all all in the business tool you bought with craft. Uh, you know, already hard and everything. It's not as near quality as the American high speed steel, but we are using it for wood, so we don't notice it as much. And my guidance from the people as to how often should be sharpened. I'm not being funny at all. I say too often because I really want you to sharpen so frequently that you didn't notice a difference, but only a slight difference when you went back. If you didn't sharpen frequently enough, you notice a tremendous difference. When I go to the high school, I tell the young boys they really need to pay attention because this is just like a date. You've been using this tool, you've got it all dulled down. When you sharpen it, it's just like a new day. If you start in and you left off and you find yourself laying on the floor. Okay? <laughs> you ease into this, guys. You don't just, you know, and, and that's all there is to it. Uh, because you had to open up or close the flute as it got dull. You had to push harder and you had to raise or lower the handle. Now, at that angle, you're completely wrong. You're too far out, you're too far down, and you're too far over. So each time you sharpen it, you've got to start over. If when you sharpen it, you didn't have a whole lot further that you had to come back, and you didn't have to remember, do I come this far or this far? It's just that little bit. If 
Just so I can focus. I'm okay. stuck here. This face was down on the grinding wheel and just ground away some of the steel. There we go. And then as, as I go along, if I've modified the edge or something, it will depend on whether I modify top and bottom as to where I grind. If it's just normal use, I'll just swipe it like that if it needs a good sharpening. If it needs just barely home, then I'll turn it upside down and lay it on it like so. Let's pretend that this is your grinding wheel. And you have this piece of steel over here that's this wide, and you want to grind it. There's going to be sparks coming across the stone. You cannot see underneath here to tell what's hitting, but you can see where the sparks are coming across. Where the sparks are coming is exactly where you're hitting. So now if you're grinding a skew and you bleed your skew up there and you bleed this down and all your sparks are coming right here, you know you tilt it too far that way or the other way. And you don't want to find out where you are on your usable edge. You start too high, find out where the sparks are and then raise it up to your right. And you'll notice on some of these, but these have got that's some grinding way back down here. This is partly for the demonstration and then partly just to get rid of stock. And then as you're grinding these, this one might show it nicely. See the different facets back here? That's just from finding out where the center is so that I can lay this flat on my stone and work it. What, are, what, what questions do you have on spindle work right now? Anything? Did you go over again the use of the uh, kind of cut-off tool with the... Groove in it? Okay. It's, it's the tool wasn't that much better. It was just a very slight difference right along the layer. And this is not quite as rough as that. And uh, that's why on this wood I always stay away from the pencil line and then slice it with a skew or a gouge layer. But on regular wood, it leaves it much cleaner. On copper and stuff like that, it's medium density. This is really Side like that. This is is that a the client wants that? No, because everybody can come up here and probably do a piece of opera. And you know, we see what your problems are when you got home and you got that piece and say, well that doesn't look like his. You know, so if I show you the work stock, then you go home and say, man, this is a nice work I'm doing. <laughs> so, I'm going to teach the class next time. <laughs> Terry, you had a number for this. Is that some kind of your pattern has a number? Yes. Is that something you made up or is no. this a reference or something? This is a new uh, J.B. Smith. I think it's J.B. Smith. It's uh, one of the major chair su or, uh, stair suppliers. And that's their number 310 new. Yeah. So when somebody called me and said, we need a 310, I have my story stick. And you can buy it out of oak right away. But if they put all this fancy stuff and they got your toe on their floor and wanted to tell the new, you might have to wait six months. So that's why we get to turn these things. It's a hard pine. The hard pine, yes sir. Okay. And it's hard to tell by hard pine and, and they don't even want to do it. Uh, and they don't do the redwood either because it chips out. So, 
and, and this being a chip. Okay? I might do this again. I got a Terry. I got to I got a kick start on mine. I don't turn my leg off. There's two ways I go about it. But I have a, a cable in there because my motor stops it. I don't just turn this thing on and hope that everything's set up right. I disengage the clutch just like my car, turn it on, and then ease in. If it's out of balance, I step on the clutch and turn it off. If it's good, I don't. So, yeah, I couldn't find the door, but. <laughs> Cheap, cheap, cheap. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the rest of us have one of them. You just spend the work, and then you get this damn lacquer off of here. Yeah. Unless you want to wait forever. See how much cleaner we get? Unless you want to wait for for this thing to slow down, if you grab this with lacquer, it just pulls the skin right off your hand. Yeah, it does that really. Uh, Put wax on it. And, and, and that's what's on the side of it. Okay. So what is the best cover? Just raw wood, and it comes off your hand afterwards. And it's sand and clean, and that's it. We're going to be ready for a break now. Okay. Good job. Back there on the back is a sample of reeds. Uh, there's some threaded stock. There's some indexing wheels. You can see that, that one there. That's a reed jack. And if you look at that carefully, you'll see one of those reeds is too narrow. All right? When you, when you do your indexing wheel, if it's got any slop in it, make sure you always turn the same direction. Don't go backwards one. If you had to go backwards, go backwards too far, and then bring it back up so that it always keeps at the same exact distance each time. So I kept that one because of that. Uh, there's some index wheels back there that have quantities and degrees on them. One of the books that's out there from which would you hold up that one? And that comes out of all the books with segmented turnings. So it's real nice. I use it for indexing. And there's three or four of these with different implements on them that pretty much fit what I need. When I've got another one, it has a Standard, like 32, I drill holes in it and use that all the time. Then if I've got something that's really odd, I wrap a piece of paper on the outside of it. You tell me what hand, boy. That piece of paper on the outside, you wrap it around it, lay it out, divide it off into 11 or 13 or whatever the information you need, and take it back on there. You bring it around each one and clamp it down. Yeah. So, Are there any beer drinkers though? Know? Is there anybody in here that doesn't drink beer? Yeah. Okay. There's a place downtown called the Flying Saucer. And they had the tap that goes into the case. So they came to me and they wanted a uh, mallet. This was leftover six by six from the column and just a piece of poplar. So we turned this while he's standing right there and worked out the design and profile and stuff. And then we later made it. The head was hard label, soft label, I'm sorry, the red label. And where the little groove is, <coughs> there was walnut glued into there in a segment, so it looked like a solid piece. And then turned down and left a little bit proud like the other one. Now that looks like a steel band on the beer barrel. A uh, beer barrel, okay. And you have a big page in beer, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, and that's all we got. Uh, has anybody ever been down there? The flying saucer? Yep. Okay. Are you married? Is your wife in there? Okay. Nope. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Oh, well, that's where the thing is. I don't think I bumped into it, but we didn't see it coming. Oh, my guidance is if you're married, your wife doesn't know about it, you make sure, all right? If she does know about it, don't ever go there without her. <laughs> <laughs>
There's a very important piece of wood playing back there so that when you go to buy a diamond parting tool, you need to look at that and make sure it doesn't look like that because it will not function well when you get it. And I have, I have corrected more than one of them that way. So, should we take a break? Take about 10 minutes. Over. It was going to take too long. But well, that's, that's just the way it is. Some of us are good and some aren't. <laughs> I work. You're good, you're good. Just okay. somehow you got us. What else? Want to emphasize the college system? Real makes a very nice college system more related. If you're going to do the icicles and such for ornaments, much better to have this spinning around than it is this. Okay? And this works better on the top of it. I bought that too. I'm telling you, it was really good. I've got a rectangular piece of wood in here. You simply got fairly in between these. I'm not going to try perfection just to hold it until I can cut a blank for the eyesight. And you have on sizing tools, an 11 16th wrench that has been opened up to just, just about three quarters of an inch. A couple of reasons. That cuts it off. This branch is ahead on the floor back and forth. Guys that I do furniture repair parts for that know really like this. The ones that don't know, they're not too happy about it. You cannot put the glue on this and stand there and talk for five minutes. Okay? You get the glue on it and put it together because it's just like the biscuits, it's been compressed. So when when you're cleaning out that three-quarter inch hole in the chair, that was bigger than three-quarter. Because this is compressed, it takes up some of that slack. If it's a decent chair in the first place, even if it's an exact three-quarter, it just locks that much more tightly. So it works pretty well. A vernier caliper is real nice. And if you don't know how to read it, just go to the machinist and and if he always holds it this way, pay attention to what he says and then go home and do it the right way. <laughs> because your eyes are this way, it's hard to match up like that. And that's what those are. With your eyes this way, it's real easy to match up like this. So when you're on the same level, and that's because we try to let our hands all the time anyway, you can get in there close. So the lines go this way. So you gotta turn it this way to get down to that one that's three thousandths of an inch. It makes it so much easier. So. The collet system makes an ER32, which you don't need to remember, but the good part is every machine and supply catalog in America carries these collets. When you get the Beal system, you get five collets. I think it's a quarter, three eighths, half, and three quarter, and I don't know what else. If you wanted the three sixteenths, you get machinist catalog and order. Because they make tens of thousands of them, they're fairly inexpensive. The sizing gauge, this wrench started out as, a, as 11 sixteenths. I wanted 12 sixteenths. If I had started with a three-quarter inch wrench, by the time I dress it, it would have been too big. So you start with the closest one that you can dress and get to a clean size when you open it up. There's a little bit of a cutting edge right there. I sized this first just by eye to start with because 
this center on this one way center, that's a three quarter ten mechanism on there. So if I turn this wood, which is just slightly bigger than that thread, I know it's slightly bigger than three quarters of an inch. If you don't have that, you use the caliper that says slightly large, and then you cut it down. This is to fit into the collar. Yes. Okay. Just, just the this is This is an exaggerated on vex piece. You can only get contact here and here because this is less. That's going to allow it to wobble inside of there. So you have two choices: either be perfect or concave in the middle. But pretty close on the ends. Perfect is too hard to get. So we're really close, and I've simply taken away a little bit of that wood in the middle so that I cannot rock back and forth in there in that pile. And that was the reason for that. Mm -hmm. You make some good parting tools for doing that too, but then you gotta turn the legs on again. These aren't so bad. But the correct way to install them in the chill is you to have some sort of support so that when you foolishly turn it by hand and drop it, it doesn't fall on the ground. Right? So it's not going. Now, these aren't so heavy. So what we should do is support the chill with one hand and unscrew it with the other. And then you don't drop it. And we got a three hundred dollar chuck a couple of times. It really makes you feel bad. It hurts, especially if you hit your foot. That too, yeah. This is your build topping system. Does any has anybody doesn't know what a pin chunk is? Or does everybody know what a pin chunk is? Okay. These are expensive too. You go to the store and you buy a piece of three quarter inch steel and you file a flat in it right there, okay? And then you take a pin and it lays in that flat. You build a three quarter inch hole in a piece of wood and you push this into it. And what happened when you twisted it, this pin rolled over to the side and now you can see that it sticks up above here and locked it on and it drives it. To improve on this, take this part of it and take a file. Where are we? Fingers. Okay, here we are. And put straight grooves down through here. It will slide into your stock easily and it will lock in so that it doesn't spin. So that you're getting most of the drive from these grooves, not just the pressure of the pin. And the softer the wood, the more important that is because this will sink into the wood. If this is slippery, then it never works. Yeah. Three quarter fits your gear collar. Now you can put that in there. Let's hope that this will fit in here. It's a brand new collet. I don't think it's been broken in yet. So that collet is machined for a one-way thread? You can buy it for the, is it 733? I think it is. One eight, one and a quarter eight, and maybe three quarter sixteen, I'm not sure. So what do you have here? You have an adapter? Yes, this is oh, You're adapting. A one eight to a, I a one way. Now this, span the range is really nice, it stays there. That's 
like, what have I got with it? He's got this kind of a square and it's really crummy. <laughs> they have since improved them. And now they have round pins and they have two spanners so that you can make it work well. Okay. You still have to do this to get it about right. With the clutch system, I don't do that. I've got the clutch, it slips in. Let me lock this in here. I load up, it locks it, and this in case you take it off and it works. This is for your eye service.
they started to put that bar on this. Right? And this is bar to bar. Because this method really works if you ride the belly. Take this pin out. This is just a piece of steel off the shelf. 
Uh, it's slightly bigger than the 3.8. I checked it up in my collar, shaved it down, filed it, turned the smaller part to fit up in here, and now uh, this fits my pre-board lamp parts. So I'm going to make a lamp rather than to try to drill a hole so that it's centered the way I just turned. I drill the hole in the blank first and then set the hole on my center. Now, even if the hole is so far off I'm clear over here, I'm still going to turn center because it turns on my center. And it works really well. For the people who've gotten an axe stuck in the firewood, you know how hard it is to get it out. It's not because your tail stops pushing it in there. It's because the wood's pinching inside of the axe. I designed and worked on this thing, laid it, took it in iron places. Yep, it worked good. It's been out for 100 years. But we don't know about it. It's because there's no gimmick to it. It's straight here, and it's tapered on the inside. For those of you who are doing the inside-out business ornaments, this thing is really nice because you don't have to glue them together because it pinches them together. I turn it, back the tailstock off, turn it inside out, put it back together, bring it back out, burn it in just like it did before, finish turning, and you're good to go. But you must taper to the inside because you want your these pieces pushed together. You do not want to split your wood apart. So you took the soft steel and carved that out first, then drilled it, or drilled yep. it and carved it? And used the high speed steel tools yeah. to clean it up. You can see it's been dropped. You can see it's burned there a little bit. And that's real easy to dress. And you, can, you can actually probably dress it with this right now. So are most cup centers designed that way? <laughs> nope. Most cup centers are designed for a different purpose. They're designed to allow you wood rotate with minimum pressure so that it does not burn, but still with enough pressure and angle so that it does not come out of the light of you. That's assuming it's not a bearing center. Well, even that one has that same profile as a solid dead center. You've got your rotating and your solid, but this profile is the same on most of them. Okay? This purpose is to allow the wood to slip. Okay? This is to drive it. And when you have this rounded part here, you don't have to drive the spurs in, and this will lock in so fast. Just get the axe in the wood once it locks in. I was going to bring a straight razor and let somebody try it. You can lock this down, you can pull across here with a straight razor, and she can push down on it with a little finger, and you can't pull it through there. Because that straight razor will drop in, and that wood will pinch it so tightly that you can't pull it through there. You've got to lift it up. It's the same physics here. You just pinch as you do it, and then when you're done, you can back the tail stock off the hanger and drop it like that and fall off. <coughs> this is some of the Mark Soleil type stuff. Your fine cuts and all. I was going to pass this around a little slow. I left this shoulder a little bit proud on both sides and you can see that and it's much easier to see it if you look at the negative space than it is if you look at it because you're looking at grain and it's supposed to look that way if you pick up the negative space behind it and look at it it shows that you're all the time telling you to ride the bell now you ride the bell and cut that thing Get off the bell, people. It's to use. You line up and you glide across it. It took me years to get Stuart Batty to quit saying ride the bell. And now Lewis Stuart or his father says to ride the bell. That's how we got those spirals to help ride the bell. That's how we want. You cannot ride that little bit of piece. Okay. Indexing and uh, the flutes. Sorry I'm so slow. If you have more than one lathe, make this carriage so that it fits your smallest lathe. 
this will go on one of my legs, and then I added this part to go on to my other leg, rather than making another carriage here, it's kind of off later. Okay. The router bit comes out here, it's got that V shape. This rides against the wood so it can only go so deep. If you do the ones in the books where they build that box on top, Every time you do one, it's a different size, you need a different size box. You need a different height on it for a different size spot. And try doing one that's curved like that for a flat box. Can you point that up? Point it this way for a second. There you go. Thank you. And uh, with this here, the only requirement is that you hold your cutter at 90 degrees to the tangent of your stock. So if you have a large curve, you have to twist your rattle around so that you're always pointing straight out the surface. Because if you don't, your cutter's out here, you move over here. And that's it. If, you, if you're going to lay out and cut your own, you need to make one of these. This fits a 16-inch blade. And in Cincinnati, the guy was telling me that this, I shouldn't tell people this at all because it's really difficult to get this home at exactly the correct height when you screw these things together. I never thought that anybody would do it that way, but he did. And, I mean, I never thought to mention it because I, I just couldn't conceive of that. You put the thing together, you put the pencil bit the pencil size bit in here. You set it on the bed of your lathe. And you back it up and you drill the hole. It's got to be the right size and the right height. So you know, put it together first, then drill it. Don't drill it and then put it together. Okay? I'm going to hit something real quick on thread chasing because I want, we want to know if you guys want something on it later. Uh, there were things over there that were uh, chased. How many threads at all? For those of you who get the magazine new turning design, you had some pretty good ideas in there, but some of them were way too much work and wrong. I've got thread chasers that I made. Ten minutes? Okay, got thread chasers that I made over 20 years ago, and they still go just fine. And if you look at the brass rod back there, that was done chased on the lathe with these hand chasers here. If you want to make a chaser, well, you've got to have a wife who works at Harris Teeter. <laughs> The, uh, the little plastic things that have grocery stores, they're real, they're real nice. I heat this with a heat gun, and it's hot enough you need to wear a glove. And then, uh, this is clamped in the vise. Quickly grab it, and wrap it around it, and it cools, and that's it. It doesn't fall off during transportation, and it's long enough so that, so that you clear the ends. And I really like them. So this is a 10 thread per inch. Piece of wood drilled by whatever your machinist notes tell you for a three-quarter 10 tap. You buy a set of chisels that are inexpensive but you know scrapey good ones. Torch them so they're soft. If you can carve it with your pocket knife, it's good. You insert it into here. I'm going to leave it sticking proud so you can see where it goes. But when you're doing it, you leave it down below there. Because you, now you have to start your tap into your stock. Now as that tap goes down into there, it's going to cut threads into here, or teeth. It's only going to cut a very small amount. So only go down a shallow amount just to mark it, and then take 
what your machine is called a three square file. Mine's typing, I don't know what it means to have a three square. But you just take your, your triangular file and then it just happens it's the same exact degrees as your teeth in here. You can bulk that out. And then once you've got it bulked out, you put it back into here. You start your tap, and then you bring this up to it so you're keyed where you belong. Once you're keyed in there, you clamp this really tight so this won't move much. And you continue on down. And this is wood, so I super glued the surfaces, the teeth on here, and then I paste waxed them so that it slides real well without eating up the wood. And once that's done, then you probably should mark on here how many teeth per inch that is so that you don't pick up the wrong one later on. The taps, some of them are kind of expensive, especially the bigger ones, and you want as big as you can get. So you can make it a tube and protect them. And that's pretty easy that way. We have 10 minutes. What things would you like that we have covered? I like to have had covered that we didn't. Anything at all? Uh oh. I'm not loving that. You're going to have to come back. Is, is there anything? Would you all like for somebody to give, to give you a full presentation on grid chasing? Yes. Okay. Would you like to have a, what they call a breakout session and people get together and make their own grid chasers? Yes. You'll pay the $70 a set. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Following on the Christmas ornaments and globes, the screwdrivers back there were number three Phillips, and the one that has the coat hanger on it, slides back and forth, so that you bolt it out, and that coat hanger gives you the thickness as you're going through there. You don't even have to stop and put a gauge in it. In case you want to, there are gauges there for that purpose. Thank you, sir. You don't want to miss out on that one. Okay, where are we? <laughs> yeah, he's here 20. Okay. Isn't that why you're you sitting there and hold that so they can't see it? You should. You got to back up. I don't think you're right here. I apologize. Okay. Senior Spiral? Isn't no, you're too close now. Isn't it 15? Right there. Senior Spiral? It's 10. It's 10. I'm thinking maybe just to vote a, a, maybe a 20 minute time just for that. Okay. When they make Christmas ornaments, or is that something you want to do? Put that on the globe, Christmas ornament? Yeah, that goes on my ice and on my cap. You can see it over there. Okay. This one here was, was a design for a bottle stopper. But this also is used when I do furniture repairs. A lot of Victorian furniture had a door had a pull on it, not like this. And then up here sometimes it was an exotic wood or ivory. And uh, this just incorporated the stopper, the door pull and how to do the inside all in one. For the people who wanted your furniture, I'm thinking that should be a, a breakout session rather than an entire meeting. This is important. Make this tool in steel. When you work with oak, ash, hickory, the things that have hard and soft grain, and you wanted that center to be right there, and you punched it, it walked sideways. Now it's over here. With this sharp edge, you point that in the direction you want to go and twist it, and it just walks right over there. I've taken enough time, I've hit a lot of stuff. For anybody who's interested, the golden, the golden rectangle, the golden ring. Okay. It's real nice, that's what a lot of the things are based on. And if you're making boxes, it's nice to have this chart because if you have made a 
calf that really came out something like you wanted and you want to keep it, how do you know how big to make the calf to fit the golden rectangle? It's real quick and easy to draw it out. Your cap is this big around, from here to here, and maybe that long. That's it. And this will be up here so they don't keep everybody else too long. Any, any other questions? Oh, Theo's got some stuff back there. Those squares, sometimes, no matter what jaws you've got, they're not right. And those will screw on to some other jaws on, a, on your chuck. And then you simply hollow them out to hold that finished piece of furniture so that it can make the repair part on it without screwing it up. The uh, jaws here are really, really nice. This is dovetailed. And if you look at that MDF piece of wood back there, it has a stainless steel face plate ring on it. You cannot buy that from one way because it's a big mark. <laughs> Don't even look at the catalog and try to figure out what the size is. Stuart and I couldn't figure out what the big mark is. She said, well, that's just some numbers we gave you. It doesn't match the millimeters. <laughs> you can buy the jaws that have that, that real small high tower in it, cut that thing off and get rid of it. And then turn these upside down and cut your dovetail on here so that it fits those. And now you can have a set of those made up. You can have them for sharpening, you can have them for buffing, holding. You can have it just to throw a scrap piece on and super glue it. And it fits every time then get on it. It's just really good. The spirals, none of those soft spirals are sanded. If you sand it, you're going to lose it. So you simply hit it with the two 40 ohm products, this one and this one. And that's it. There's no ones on it. If you're interested, we'll get that in the newsletter too. Any other questions? Okay.